Welcome back to part two of Electrolytes Made Easy. So if you're here, you've already seen part one and signed up for a free account on Picmonic.com and learned the 10 Picmonics on magnesium, hypomagnesemia, hypermagnesemia, magnesium sulfate, phosphorus, potassium, hypokalemia, hyperkalemia, parts of an ECG, and digoxin toxicity. These are linked in the summary below. And if you haven't already, go do that now so you're up to speed. Now here's Kendall to teach our future nurses some more electrolytes. So the next one, and probably the most confusing one for students, is calcium. 8.5 to 10.5, right? 8.5 to 10.5. And you think about calcium, calcium makes your bones strong, drink your milk, right? Yeah, that's, that's important. Calcium is your bones. It's what makes your bone make up osteoblasts, create bone, and um, osteoclasts break down bone, right? That's B blasts are builders. That's how you should always think of that. B blast is a builder, building bone, or building. You know, there are other types of blasts. So we think about that, and then we you think about calcium as kind of a cellular excitability. I love this character. This is our 8.5, um, 8.5 eight ball time clock with a 0.5 hand. With this calcified cow pouring this um, 10, 10, um, 0.5 out of his 0.5 hand. So that's 8.5 to 10.5. A picture lets you memorize the normal values. So if you can remember 8.5 to 10.5, even if you only remembered 8 to 10, here's an important point to remember on all of your exams. Let's say you're not the best at memorizing, even with the pictures. Maybe you can't always get the best one. If you can remember 8 to 10, you're probably going to get a calcium value that's 6.7. Then you can know that that's abnormal. Um, you're going to get a calcium value of 11.5. You're not going to get a calcium value of 10.6. It's very rare. You have an evil instructor because not only does the um, you know the, the the normal values vary from lab to lab, but they're going to give you a clearly abnormal value, and that's how you can remember that. So we think about cellular excitability. You think about this 10.5, um, 10, 10 calcified cow pouring his little uh, milk on his little bones here, this milk bones, and um, that's how we can think about calcium from milk helps you with bones and it's cellular excitability and we think about this little um, cell character here being so super excited about his bone milk and his bone plates. So that's how you can really um, remember a lot of this concept of pulling it together. So let's look at um, an interesting point with calcium is um, calcium, uh, there's a serum level. We talked about this already. Like if I took your blood, I take some blood sample. I'm a vampire. I'm going to take some of your blood. I take five mLs of your blood. I can measure uh, a free calcium and ionized calcium, and, and, and the ionized portion is the part that's bound to protein, because approximately 50% of the calcium is bound to protein. So um, there's a, a serum level, but then there's the intracellular level, right? So we have a serum level um, in the serum, so that's free and bound, so free, which is just floating around there doing whatever it's one, and then there's 50% of it bound to proteins, and then there's the inside the cell calcium. And that's why I keep saying calcium is kind of one of those really kind of out there difficult ones that's uh, hard for a lot of students to really understand. So as a high yield point, if I have a patient, um, when, you, when I think of, or let me just, when I think of protein, what do I think about in the blood? If I say protein, what do you immediately spit back out as a lab value for me? What is the protein that almost everything binds to? Albumin. Albumin is a, the most abundant protein in our body, so most of the calcium binds to albumin. Now, albumin itself, what types of patients have a low albumin level? That's an important point. What kind? If I have a patient, I said a patient has a low albumin level, what are you probably going to think about? Mm, ah, Tamika, malnourishment. A patient who's starving doesn't have any protein because they don't eat very well, right? I mean, yeah. Or somebody said a patient who is um, completely on, who only eats carbs. That's also true. You you would have a low amount of protein. Um, or a vegan could ha could have a low amount of protein, possible. Um, but uh, and then maybe some renal patients could have lower protein. But most importantly, the high yield point you want to think about low protein is uh, low albumin level is a malnourished patient, especially for the NCLEX and high yield points with that. So a low a malnourished patient probably has a decreased protein albumin, and then they probably have a decreased um, ionized or bound calcium level, right? So then their bones get weak. I mean, you see all these things, one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, whichever way you're looking at the screen. 
ends up causing another problem. That's kind of how you need to think about this. You're putting a lot of concepts together. I'm tying little bits of information for you together so you go, wow, I never really thought about that. That's pretty true. And um, that's exactly how you should think about it. Um, Mary also said, um, you know, anemia and, and general blood loss. And those things are, those are possibilities for um, low albumin as well. Um, also is, you know, um, liver patients, patients who are in liver failure don't make albumin because where are proteins synthesized? They're in the liver. Um, so if you don't have a liver, then you will not make protein. So that's another uh, little tidbit there just to tie it all together. High yield point immediately, malnourished usually has a low albumin. And we have a picmonic to help you remember the normal lab value for albumin as well. So without getting off too much of a tangent, let's look at high and low calcium. So a hypocalcemia. So I think about this hippo cow here, this little image I made for you. Well, I didn't make it, but I wished I did, could draw that well. This calcified cow, low calcium level, then I'm going to think about everything pretty much being very excited. I mean, the neuronal excitement with a low calcium level, those those electro ion threshold levels are, are um, easily fired, and they're immediately, very easily um, uh, triggered. And so I see muscle contraction, increased muscle contraction, this up arrow muscle right here in this image. And I see like diarrhea, muscle spasms. I'm, I got Charlie horses all over the place. And tetany. If you have a patient with tetany, that's what you should be thinking. Um, these, you know, they tighten all up. We won't be thinking botulism, right? We won't be thinking that unless you had what type of thing that we don't give to kids because of clostridium? Botulism toxin? Honey. So we're tying all this stuff together, but tetany. So tetany, hypocalcemia. I don't want to jump too much, but we see trisosine. Trisosine. So what is trisosine? Hmm. So when we think of trisosine, if I put a blood pressure cuff on your arm and I tightened it up, what's going to happen is I'm going to draw in my hands. They're going to curl in like this. They're going to curl in just like that because of this a neuronal, this neuronal excitement at those neuronal implants causes this contraction very easily. And we see seizures, of course. But thinking about seizures is not something you want to think about in all these because seizures technically could almost happen in any of these electrolyte or abnormalities, and, um, as well as QT prolongation. And that's kind of just a high yield point that probably is too advanced for, um, for you know, an electrolyte lecture, but it's really good for a really good, um, uh, really good advanced cardiac lecture. So what about hypercalcemia? So if I think about way too much calcium, increased calcium levels, well, I know that calcium as general is for uh, uh, neuronal excitability, cellular excitability. So if I have a high... Um, uh, potassium, then, actually, I think I, yeah, sorry. Um, so a high potassium, then I'm going, or high calcium, I'm getting way too many numbers and things mixed up in my brain, then we're going to see um, this uh, oppositional decreased muscle contraction. Um, so it, the muscles don't contract as much. We're going to see um, constipation. But why do we see an opposite constipation versus diarrhea? That's because of different types of receptors. Something is really important and a, a really hard concept. I, I, I actually did a lecture on this once. There are different types of receptors that I didn't learn in when I was in nursing school. There are these adrenergic receptors and muscarinic receptors, and there are different types of receptors on each different type of tissue. Um, and I didn't learn that in nursing school, and that's something that really, um, really tried, really kind of um, helped with a lot of these things. Um, so to help me kind of differentiate different types of receptors and how they then respond. So there's an important one that I, I left out here. So hypocalcemia, I left it out on purpose. So which one of the, what am I going to think about? What else am I going to see in hypocalcemia that I left out here that's a very high yield point? I left it out on purpose. Let's see if anybody catches it. Schafsteck's sign. And that's, uh, what is Schafsteck's sign? Well, it's neuronal excitability at the... Um, at the uh, muscle implant, and what happens is, if you tap right here on the facial nerve, it causes a twitch, it causes a twitch, and you actually see it. So I just think Shavtek, I just think up there, and I was think Trousseau, and we actually um, pick it, um, have a picmonic for this, which is a truce, like a truce sign that we show um, for it. So um, that's definitely, definitely true. So uh, as we go through these, let's just 
Um, I think I've got another image right here. Yep, so here's the hypocalcemia pigmonic. So I showed you this hypocalcemia pigmonic. So do you see increased dictin reflexes? Of course, everything's excited. And you see here is truce. This is this truce sign, curved in truce sign, trousseau sign. And chopsticks, we show chopsticks to help give you these chopsticks. Do you remember that chopsticks, chopsticks. And tetany, you can always remember this, titanic right here. Well, that's exactly how you need to think about it. And that's, as you think about these, it's how you should think about how they go through. And why would we see in a hypocalcemia, hypocalcemia, a decreased um, serum calcium level, why would you have decreased bone density? If I see this decreased bone density, why do I see that? Decreased bone density, um, calcium level is, is um, regulated by PTH, parathyroid hormone. So remember on the back of the thyroids? So what do we think about? Anytime we take out the thyroids, we have to be very, very careful if you're a surgeon which maybe somebody is a surgeon is watching, or very careful when you take out the thyroids to leave the parathyroids, right? Because anybody whose thyroid gets taken out and we accidentally take the parathyroids, what happens? Boom, hypocalcemia. But that's because parathyroid hormone stimulates the osteoclast, and the osteoclasts break down bone to break it down into calcium to increase the calcium level. It's, it's a balance, balancing game. That's what we got to think about with these, and that's how um, maybe I went on a rant, but that's definitely um, how we can tie it all together to put it into a big picture of. So you have a low calcium, uh, low calcium level. Okay, great. Well, there's lots of causes of low calcium, but one thing we know for sure, if you have a low calcium level, is that your parathyroids are working overtime to create PTH, parathyroid hormone, to break down your bone, to increase that bone, break it down into a serum calcium level to compensate for it. And then somebody with a chronic low calcium level, like a renal patient, ends up with brittle bone disease, and they end up breaking down bone. Or somebody with, uh, well, we're not going to get too much in that. I, I can sit here and just ran on these kind of things all day. But that's how we kind of put it all together so that the image, it really um, ties in. So we've, we've learned a concept, and then I've tied it in here. And inside of our Picmonics, and you go into each one of these, so I clicked on, if I clicked inside of our Picmonic player and I clicked on that, it's going to give you that kind of um, definition inside of there, and I know because I wrote most of them, is going to explain to you how these osteoclasts and PTH, um, PTH is stimulating the bone, which causes this osteoclast activity to break down the bone and then create it. So if you didn't quite know, you can click on it to review it, um, and that's kind of how it works. So um, hopefully you just kind of click click in there and how it works. Another, why do, why do renal patients have hypocalcemia? I can't believe I just slipped my mind. Well, so one thing you should know right away is you see, if you buy milk, I mean, anybody has bought milk, right? I got milk. I love my milk. Not really. I'm lactose intolerant. I hate milk. But if I bought milk, okay, I do, but I buy lactate. But so let's say I did buy milk and I loved it. I may see the option at the grocery store to have milk with vitamin D. Why does milk have vitamin D? Vitamin D is in there because vitamin D converts in the kidney. Um, it converts hydroxylase, the calcium, from a pre from the calcium from step one to step two, we'll call it. So if you don't have vitamin D, that that doesn't happen. But also, if you don't have kidneys, that doesn't happen. So you end up with a decreased calcium level, and that's how you think about this. And most of the vitamin D doesn't come from milk. Most of the vitamin D comes from where? I live in Arizona. I know a lot about it. So most of the vitamin D comes from the sun, from your skin. Your skin metabolizes vitamin D and creates it. So it's actually really rare that you have a vitamin D deficiency unless you live in a cave, which is yeah, some vampires. I'm sure they have that problem, but everyone knows all vampires sparkle. So that's, that's, a, that's a done deal. That completes part two of Electrolytes Made Easy. Before we go on to part three, make sure you go into the Picmonic learning system with your free account and review the seven Picmonics that we just learned about in part two, which were calcium, hypocalcemia, hypercalcemia, and albumin. We also touched on therapeutic diets, hypoparathyroidism, and vitamin D. There's a playlist link with these picmonics in the description below. Make sure you have these topics memorized before we continue on to part three.